Hi. Uh, my name is Gabriel Wilgen. I'm with the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund here at Harvard. I uh, want to thank you all for coming here today. It's a really nice day outside. There's other talks going on, so I appreciate you choosing to be here. Um, definitely want to thank the Animal um, Legal Defense Fund for sponsoring this event and the Animal Law and Policy Program for sponsoring the event. Um, and of course, our speaker today, Anita Krines, for coming here all the way from Toronto, Canada to talk. Uh, before I get into introducing Anita, I just want to tell you a little bit of housekeeping about the rest of the week. Uh, as a lot of you probably know, uh, today is day three of Animal Law Week here at Harvard. Um, we have two more great speakers coming tomorrow and Friday. Tomorrow we have uh, ex-NFL player, 300-pound uh, vegan David Carter coming to talk about food oppression in our food system, especially as it relates to uh, factory farming and plant-based foods, um, and how plant-based foods are part of the answer. And then on Friday we have Sharon Nunez uh, from Animal Equality, uh, which is a really fantastic uh, charity doing a lot of great work for animals. So hope you can make it out for those talks as well, um, but we really appreciate you being here today. Uh, and now it's a really a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Anita Kreint, someone who's inspired me a lot personally in the past several years. She's the founder or co-founder of uh, the Pig Save movement, uh, starting with Toronto Pig Save and the Save movement more generally, which has exploded into hundreds of cities across the world in recent years. Uh, especially as Anita became uh, kind of a real uh, figurehead for the animal protection movement uh, when she was put on trial for uh, criminal m mischief charges for feeding water to a overheated pig on a slaughterhouse truck and really took that opportunity to uh, uh, put the factory farming industry on trial even though she was the one technically on trial. And she's really just somebody who I've seen as uh, an example of how you can use kindness and compassion and speaking with moral clarity to get your message across rather than necessarily speaking from a place of anger or a place of uh, adversary, adversarial type thinking. Um, and uh, Anita has a, a PhD in political science from the University of Toronto and has taught for a long time at Queen's University. Um, and she's just uh, been, again, a really great advocate for animals. So please give her a warm welcome uh, to Anita Kreitz. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Um, it's great being here. Um, um, I wanted to thank all the organizers. And um, I just wanted to start off by asking you uh, um, if you're vegan. Like, how many people are vegan? Do you want to put up your hands? So, not everyone's vegan here. Good. OK, uh, not good, but I mean, good to know. Um, uh, how many people have done activism? Like animal activism, if you could put your hands up high. How many, yeah, yeah, okay, good. So more people are vegan than activists, and a lot of people are vegan here, so. Um, so I wanted to start with a quote by Leo Tolstoy. He was born in 1828 and died in 1910, and in the last 30 years of his life, he became an ethical vegetarian. And he said, do not believe in words, yours or others, uh, believe in deeds. And, um, in that picture that I showed you, there's no difference between a dog and a pig. It's just our prejudice. Um, so what I want to cover today is the concept of bearing witness, which is the main strategy of, the, of Toronto Pig Save, and it's a strategy lots of social movements have used historically. To talk a bit about the pig trial and uh, my charge for giving uh, water to a thirsty pig in front of a slaughterhouse, and how that has contributed to the rise of the Save movement. Um, now there are uh, over 300 groups worldwide, and, um, but we started with a group um, in Toronto called Toronto Pig Safe. So I was uh, already a vegan and an activist in 2006, and I moved back to Toronto, and I knew there was a slaughterhouse within a kilometer of where I lived, and I didn't do anything. I thought, oh, somebody should do something. Uh, somebody should leaflet there. I even contacted another active group and said, Why, can you do something there? And I, did, I didn't do anything until I adopted Mr. Bean, shown in that picture, that lovely beagle whippet. And when I adopted him, I'd walk every morning on Lakeshore, which is a really busy street on, in downtown Toronto, and I would see eight or nine transport trucks with pigs in them. And I would see the pigs looking out with their fearful and sad eyes. And at the time, I was reading books on Tolstoy, Gandhi, Ramakrishna, and they all took action when there was uh, an injustice in their community. And so the next picture shows, so that's Pig Island. So you see a transport truck in the distance there. And we would hold our vigils on this traffic island, which is about a kilometer away from the slaughterhouse, because there was a lot of rush hour traffic. And people could see us, and we could bear witness safely. So thousands of people would see us each, uh, three times a week. And then the next picture, that's my mom in the wheelchair, holding love for pigs. 
uh, we're there in front of the slaughterhouse where they would unload the pigs. So once a week we would go there, but it was more in a, a quiet area. So, and we, we could see the pigs in the distance being unloaded and hear them screaming. Um, so we use a love-based community organizing approach, which means that you organize an intensive campaign in one location to try to make change happen. Uh, and uh, our goals are fourfold. Uh, we've always, since the beginning, said our goal is to create vegans. We don't say less meat because when you bear witness to an animal, animals in a truck, you don't say, oh, let's save one. You say save them all. So it's impossible for me to actually say that. So our movement is very much promoting veganism, but it's also promoting activism because it completely changes uh, when you actually meet a victim firsthand and, and bear witness. Um, you know, I became vegan because I saw a video. That changed me. But when I bore witness uh, for the first time and really went up to a, a pig looking at, in a truck, I, I beca it became a priority in my life. So that's why I think everyone really needs to you know, bear witness. Um, so uh, another goal is to create a mass-based grassroots movement for animal justice around the world. And a fourth is to, create a, to change the cultural norm. Because right now, how many people say, um, I don't want to see? You know, there's a Facebook posting of slaughter or something, or um, there's a slaughterhouse in your neighborhood. Like, I don't want to see. I don't want to know. I'm already vegan, or I'm already an environmentalist. I'm already doing this. We, I, our movement wants that answer to be unacceptable. Ethically, it's unacceptable. Um, so the concept of bearing witness means when someone's suffering, um, you need to speak out. And I'd like to quote uh, Martin Luther King, who started speaking out on the Vietnam War, uh, in um, 1967, and he said, Hi, had I not committed myself to the principle that looking away from evil is, in effect, a condoning of it, those who lynch, pull the trigger, point the cattle prod, or open the fire hose, act in the name of the silent. I had to therefore speak out if I was to erase my name from the bombs which fall all over North and South Vietnam from the canisters of napalm. So if you want to erase your name off the slaughterhouse walls which are covered with blood, you need to act appropriately, change your diet, and also advocate. Um, so the concept of bearing witness was, was defined by Leo Tolstoy in a book called The Calendar of Wisdom, which I gave a copy to um, Chris. Um, he said it's uh, when the suffering of another creature causes you to feel pain, don't succumb to the initial desire to flee from the suffering one, but on the contrary, come closer as close as you can, and try to help. So it's such a beautiful, impactful definition of uh, bearing witness, and it's used by the SAFE movement. So Leo Tolstoy is one of the inspirations of, uh, for our movement. Um, so uh, when, when you look into the trucks and you see these animals, they're pleading for help. This photo was taken of a baby chicken uh, in a transport truck in front of Maple Leaf Poultry, where we hold weekly vigils. And she's about to be violently yanked out of that crate and hung upside down before she has her throat slit. And sometimes we see feet in the crates when the empty trucks leave because sometimes their feet get stuck in the crates and they get pulled off. So it's an extremely brutal industry. Uh, you know, the, the animals are saying, as this big, I, I watch passersby hoping you'll help. Now, our movement has been criticized by the ALF, the Animal Liberation Front's uh, founder, Ronnie Lee, as being a watch movement. He said, we're inappropriately named the safe movement because, you know, we're looking at these animals and then they go to slaughter. So, that, you know, it, there is, it's a partial form of bearing witness. It's not a full form. Only in a few hundred instances did we actually save animals at the slaughterhouse. We sometimes ask and say, please spare a life. Like a week before Easter or Passover, we say, spare the life of a lamb, and we've been successful with a lamb slaughterhouse. Uh, we've saved, in, in uh, Australia, they saved a sow just recently during Christmas time. Um, and there was a calf that was born on a slaughter truck that was saved in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. So we do occasionally save, so a few hundred, but we've witnessed mil you know, millions of animals going to slaughter. So the point that it's bearing witness, even in a partial form, is better than nothing. So it's better to be there than not to be there. It is a step forward. And Romain Roland uh, was a vegetarian uh, French Nobel laureate. Um, he, he wrote, but in art, it is not necessary to, go to combat evil with evil, but with light. The evil that is seen face to face, the evil that is conscious of being seen, is more than half conquered. So... Uh, 
you know, that's why the industry uh, wants to hide these images and, and, to, and you know, not prevent people from seeing the victims. So I think it's, it's I, I know myself, I had a prejudice, even when I was vegan and an activist, I thought the pigs in the trucks looked all the same. But when you bear witness, you see the individuality of all these animals. And um, you, those who are informed have an added social obligation to take a stand. That they must, they must lead. I've heard people say, I'm already vegan, why should I bear witness? The answer uh, is provided once again by Tolstoy. He said, one who knows the truth must bear witness to the tr of the truth to those who do not. And uh, this, this makes sense because like, who's gonna be motivated to help the animals? Like as animal lovers, as people who care about animals, as people who are informed, you have the motivation to, to do this difficult work and self-sacrifice to you know, see these, you know, these animals suffering in order to spread awareness and encourage veganism and activism on the part of other people. Um, so often the conditions of the pigs are uh, just horrific. Uh, in the summer heat, they're frothing at the mouth, they're thirsty, and I wanna show you a short video that we took uh, at a vigil at Fearman's, the place where I got charged later. Where's the water? I love you, baby. I love you so much. We love you. We love you. I love you so much. This is so wrong. So very wrong. <laughs> Whenever another creature causes you to feel pain. Do not submit to the initial desire to flee from the suffering. But on the contrary, come closer. As close as you can to him or her who suffers. And try to help. And try to help. The intent of the event. That's why we're here. Leo Tolstoy. We love you so much and we're trying our best. <laughs> Where's the water? Okay. Um, so when I, I became vegetarian in the 90s and I didn't even know about veganism then uh, and I, I don't remember seeing trucks on the highway but now when I go on the highway I see them all the time. So one of the roles of the SAVE movement and our regular vigils is to politicize these trucks so people see. Um, and as you can see, this environmentalist who have uh, bumper sticker sayings, you know, save, save, save the seals and so forth is not paying attention. And you know, what's remarkable is when you see these animals in the trucks, like they're looking, like they're waiting for somebody to help and to make eye contact. And as soon as you go there, like we've done seven years of weekly vigils, three vigils a week, and never has a pig bitten me or anyone in our, uh, and, you know, sometimes the truckers say, oh, watch it, they might bite you. They know that we're their friends and we're there to help them. Um, and uh, they're looking, they're just waiting for you, for people to take notice and to help them. And so that's why the vigils are also very important, because we're there to tell their story. Um, how many people have seen the film Okja on Netflix? So um, it's in a remarkable film. Uh, uh, they, I think they spent 50, 60 million dollars to make this film and Bong Joon-ho, the director, said um, people do not want to think about slaughterhouses. So what he did in the film was he made Okja, the super pig, no different than a dog and uh, a little girl, Mija, uh, um, uh, uh, risks her life for Okja and vice versa and they're constant companions. And Bong said, I want to portray the Oksha film from the viewpoint of an animal. It is witnessing your family being dragged into a slaughterhouse. So when you see the film, you see the, the, the pig as a dog. And many of us consider our dogs part of the family. And there's a very intensive scene where um, the pig is about to be uh, stunned in, in a, a knockbox in a slaughterhouse. Um, so Mija pleads, pleads that Oksha be released and that she take her back home. And Nancy Mirando, uh, the, care, the owner of the slaughterhouse says, no, it's my property. And that's sort of reminiscent of what we faced in, in the pig trial. And um, Bong says uh, that the machinery, the metallic machinery used to kill these animals 
disassemb disassembled beautiful cows and it was really horrible and evil and it made him go vegan at least for a short time he, he lapsed but hopefully he'll come back um, so this the, he actually visited this slaughterhouse JBS slaughterhouse to get uh, an idea of what a slaughterhouse is like but he said he could only capture 10% of what he witnessed even though that film is super powerful uh, he said he, it was an overwhelming and traumatizing experience. There is a group that we have, one of our saves, uh, Greeley Cow Save, which is run by uh, a college English teacher. And uh, she, uh, she was pressured to not speak out, and she said she only had one word for JBS, moo. Um, and at, at JBS, they murder, uh, sorry, they, yeah, they murder 5,600 cows a day. And um, there's... Uh, so you can imagine, it's a constant line of uh, ca uh, trucks coming in. So one of the things I wanted to emphasize is like, in this picture, you see, you know, they look, all, they look similar. But what you do when you come up close and bear witness, they're all individuals. And so one of the roles of bearing witness is to break the disconnect. Uh, bearing witness is the opposite of being disconnected. Um, and there's a concept in the uh, anti-globalization literature called the distancing effect you know sometimes you can purchase something and you know it might be from a sweatshop somewhere uh halfway around the world and so there's this distancing effect and people do not know the kind the harm that they're contributing to well bearing witness is is, is something that can um, counter this distancing effect and you get to see um the the impacts of, of your of your uh, food choices um, so bearing witness is an act, but it's also a, a method. And um, some of the um, aspects of bearing witness is that it involves first-hand experience, which is very powerful. It's animal-centric or animal standpoint. It's something that's incredibly simple to do, and it's very accessible. You'd be surprised at how easy it is to go to slaughterhouses and so witness a lot. Uh, it, it's a community action that involves as many people as possible, and the key is to do regular vigils. And uh, a DXC organizer, Leslie Goldberg, asked me, what is the difference between watching a film and bearing witness? And I want you to think about that, because maybe you've seen videos that had an impact on you, but bearing witness is, is uh, something that's very different. It's m much more impactful, because uh, partly because of experience. So that's the first uh, topic I want to cover is um, the power of observation. So Leo Tolstoy said, a person knows the life of other beings only through observation, and only so does she know of their existence. She knows of the life of other beings only when she wishes to think of it. So you can imagine, if you go and bear witness in front of a slaughterhouse and see terrified animals about to go to slaughter, it's gonna th you're going to think about it a lot more than you know, watching a movie. Because um, there's a level of accountability and responsibility uh, once you witness that in your own community. And Vladimir Chertkov, who was Tolstoy's best friend, uh, wrote in One Life, it's an animal rights book in 1912, said, to get a true notion of this matter, first of all, one has to face it. The best way to literally face it is by w visiting a slaughterhouse or a kitchen yard and firsthand witnessing the killing of pigs, cows, chickens, for our table. I have no doubt that the great majority of people would do it, who would do it several times with diligence would very soon recognize the unlawfulness of what is happening before their eyes. And this particular, these photos are from another uh, Philly farmed animal save. And the chicken crates are unloaded right on the street and the sidewalk before. And there you see, you see in a distance what the crates look like. And if you experience that as a passerby, that's why you need to walk up to the crates and witness the individuals. See the different, different in impact, difference in impact when you see those two photos? And there's an activist from that group bearing witness. Um, so the, this method is also animal-centric. And that's one of the reasons we really promote it is um, each individual is, uh, each, each is an individual. That becomes very clear when you are bearing witness. Your personal contact puts a face on the nameless numbers. To paraphrase Charles Dickens in his industrial novel, novel Hard Times, um, the animals become the focus of activism and also social media images that our group posts. We often witness uh, pigs that are, and other animals that are scratched. Uh, in the cold weather, we've, we see them with uh, frostbite, 
This pig has purple ears. Uh, when they're on the highway, the temperature is so much colder because you get wind chill. You see animals with tattoos carved on their skin. Um, you see absolute terror. And if you observe that uh, photo carefully, you see the terror not only in the eyes, but in the mouth. And if you ever, how many people have visited a farm sanctuary and seen happy pigs that are free? And they're completely different. The fa their faces are happy. Their eyes are happy. They're smiling. Go, go like the page uh, Esther the Wonder Pig. She's uh, near Toronto, and uh, you'll get an idea of how happy pigs can be. Cows are extremely meek and gentle creatures, and they're absolutely terrified when they go to slaughter because they can smell five miles away what's happening, and they get very sensitive when, with the loud noises and, uh, and the sights. So this is the slaughterhouse where we did our vigils, and it, it's to talk, talk about it accessible, it was across the street from a dog park, and this is shot from a condo. So you see a truck leaving, and in the mid part of the photo on the right, you see the two trucks about to turn around and go to, and unload the pigs there. And it's condos surround the area, and um, so it, it was something that was very accessible. And you know, the idea of why love one but eat the other, why love a dog and eat the other, is so obvious there. But we, it's important for activists to point that out because a lot of people walking their dogs and taking them to the dog park did not pay attention to the trucks going by. Um, and that's why it's important to have act, do, do activism. Um, some groups do city vigils. So in Melbourne, uh, the, the cow safe groups goes to busy streets and tries, they raise awareness there. So you don't only have to, you don't, you don't have to do it in front of a slaughterhouse. Our biggest save group is LA Animal Save and they have about 100 people going to their weekly vigils and they've had Rooney, um, Rooney Mara, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, Moby, a lot of celebrities go to their vigils. And Amy Jean Davis is uh, the organizer there. And her, her partner is um, Sean Munson. And he did the film Earthlings, which is a really powerful, one of the most powerful animal rights films. Um, so one of the keys is to get as many people involved as possible. Lee Staples was one of the founders of, uh, State, uh, of ACORN. And he said a successful direct tactic involves lots of people, as many people as possible. Um, when you have lots of people, it's easier to stop the trucks. And sometimes some groups have arrangements with slaughterhouses where uh, the slaughterhouse agrees to stop the trucks. So at Maple Leaf Poultry, where we do our weekly chicken save vigils, each truck stops for 10 minutes, and the plant manager arranged that. In the case of Fearman's Pig Slaughterhouse, there is no such arrangement, and you have these trucks running into mostly women. Like most of the protesters are women, and uh, all the drivers except one I've seen are men. And so it's incredible that um, how quick the police are to charge us, whereas these trucks are literally engaging in dangerous driving and assault with a weapon when they're running into these activists. Um, so we're currently in negotiations with the police and trying to get an agreement. Uh, this sergeant was very helpful. He said, it's like a labor dispute. So often labor unions, when they're striking, they would they lock the gate of the industrial site. And so he made that excellent comparison. Um, so we do regular vigils, and that's the key, but another key is to do all-day vigils and bring celebrities out, because you get more people, and you're more likely to save an animal, get media, and get lots of people attending. Um, and what we found at our all-day vigils, they might run 24 hours or 12 hours or even 30 hours, is that half the people are new. So I just want to uh, end with like, talking a bit about the pig trial and the rise of the safe movement. So... Uh, this photo was taken two years before I was charged, so we've been giving water to thirsty pigs for years. And I want to provide you some details of the criminal case, the defense, the media campaign, and the verdict. I'll just show you a bit of the footage from this day. Can you give this guy some water? If you give them thirsty, if you are, Jesus said, if you're thirsty, you give them water. No, if you're gee, you know what? These are not, these are not humans, you dumb frickin' broad. Hello? You know what? Now we're gonna call have, the have cops. Some, have some compassion. Have some compassion. Let's call the cops. Have some compassion. What do oh, we do? Jesus. 911? Go ahead. Yeah, no. What do you got in that water? Water. No, no. That's my no. Yeah? Don't put it in there again. This, this is just pigs thirsty, so don't have water. You do it again and I'll slap it out of your hands. Go ahead. If you want to do, a, do a assault charges, go ahead. Tell me, 
this. If he wants to assault uh, charges, please. go ahead. So um, the next day after this incident, uh, the factory farmer Eric Van Boykel fi filed charges at the police station in Halton. At the time, he still owned the pigs, technically. Um, once they're delivered and unloaded, the slaughterhouse owns them. Um, Eric Van Boykel uh, was quoted in the Canadian press as saying, don't touch my stuff. So very much saw the pigs as his property. Um, I was charged with uh, criminal mischief, interfering with lawful use, enjoyment, or operation of property, the property being the pigs. The penalty was uh, initially a maximum of 10 years in jail and 5,000 fine, but at a pretrial, the judge changed the maximum fine to six months. And um, at the court, dis uh, the disclosure simply stated that uh, the accused was observed by Van der Graaf, uh, Jeff, the truck driver, to be spraying an unknown liquid into the trailer when the hogs were, um, were situated. Um, it led to uh, almost a two-year tr uh, trial process. There were about five pre-trials and uh, five court dates uh, tr with witnesses and then an additional uh, day for closing statements and then the verdict. And uh, those are my two vegan lawyers, uh, James, James, James Silver and Gary Grill. And we had people uh, do slaughterhouse, uh, sorry, um, courthouse vigils at all the pre-hearings and the trial. And there was media scrums already at the pre-trial. So it became a huge story in Canada. Um, and James Silver, one of my lawyers, came up with a hashtag, compassion is not a crime. And we used that in our campaign. There were demonstrations at a Canadian embassy in Portugal, um, one in Argentina, and then there were solidarity vigils. We had four expert witnesses, and what really impressed me with my lawyers, like I didn't expect this, but they even invited someone to speak on the health benefits of a vegan diet. Uh, um, Dr. Uh, David Jenkins, he invented the glycemic index. He had five degrees from Oxford. He was a vegan. He was a professor at the University of Toronto, and he discussed uh, the diseases caused by meat, dairy, and eggs. Uh, we had another ex-professor talk about animal agriculture as the leading cause of environmental catastrophe, that was Tony Weiss. So these two um, witnesses, David and Tony, uh, David Jenkins and Tony Weiss, and then we had two female witnesses who talked not so much about our self-interest in, in helping animals, but they talked about the animal suffering. So um, we had a, a veterinarian uh, talk about Dr. Lori Marino. She's quite famous. She's in California. Uh, she talked, she counted the number of breaths that these pigs were taking in the video, and it was about 200 breaths, 10 times the normal rate per minute. So, and uh, then we also had Dr. Lori Marino, she's a famous cognitive behavioralist, and she talked about the sentience of pigs and argued that pigs are persons, not property based on science, uh, because they have complex communications, uh, personalities, and so forth. Um, so we tried to highlight that fact that pigs are not property, they are persons. Another thing we highlighted in this case was the golden rule, and again to quote from Leo Tolstoy, we should take pity on animals in the same way as we do on each other, and we all know this if we do not deaden the voice of conscience inside us. It's a really beautiful uh, sort of definition of the golden rule applying to all life. Um, just quickly, uh, you know, historically, people have been charged for showing compassion. So uh, there was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, the Tolstoy's famine relief, uh, where authorities tried to outlaw it. Uh, and then we have Stephen Weiss's non-human rights project advocating for the legal personhood of animals. In terms of the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, people could be sentenced up to six months in prison and fined of 1,000 uh, for giving food to a runaway slave. And Harriet Beecher Stowe was so incensed that she wrote Uncle Tom's 
Cabin, how many people have read that book? So just an incredible book, strongly recommend it. And she said, that, well, this book helped raise consciousness and su support for the abolition of slavery, and it was the second best-selling book of the 19th century after the Bible. And it really helped uh, promote, as I said, the cause of uh, abolition, and pre President Lincoln himself said so. Um, in terms of uh, an example from Tolstoy, uh, he, there was a number of famines in Russia and surrounding areas, and there was a particularly bad one in 1892, and he and his whole family took a year, more than a year off, to engage in uh, famine relief and set up soup kitchens, and over 200 soup kitchens. And this is his son, Ilya. He said, I tried to convince him, this is a police officer, that there could be no law prohibiting charity. This, of course, was to no avail. And then Leo Tolstoy said, people cannot be prohibited from eating. And the police officer said, said, put yourself in the position of a man who is under orders from his superiors. What would you have me do, Your Excellency? Uh, Leo Tolstoy says, uh, it's very simple. Don't work where you can be made to act against your conscience. Um, and you uh, must all know a, a, a lot about the Non-Human Rights Project and the work of Stephen Weiss. Um, so animals currently in the legal system are often seen as things, and that ignores their most basic interests, their lives, their suffering, their freedom. Um, uh, legal personhood establishes the legal right to be recognized as a potential bearer of legal rights in the court system. And uh, again, his project emphasizes equality and liberty. Uh, so what was Judge Harris's ruling? Uh, I was uh, found um, not guilty, but on the grounds that I didn't actually interfere with the property, being the pigs. So the pigs still went to slaughter. So it was a, it was a victory in those terms, but not a victory in terms of what we were fighting for. Uh, he's called pigs property. It wasn't a nuanced decision. He, um, you know, it, it, he said they are property just like cats and dogs, but again, there's, it's a gray area, and he didn't really address that. Uh, he didn't accept the, my lawyer's argument that I was acting in the public interest, and that could counter, like, it, it, it could apply in a case of a criminal mischief charge. Um, and he dismissed the test, part of the testimony and all of the testimony of doctor, uh, of the two female uh, expert witnesses. So he dismissed the testimony of Dr. Armady May, May because she was an, someone who spoke out on animal rights. So uh, and my lawyer said, you know, how can you do that? It's like if somebody was a lawyer in the 1800s and was opposed to slavery and was working on a case or was an expert witness, would you dismiss them? Should they be pro-slavery in order for you to grant them recognition? Um, and then um, Dr. Lori Marino also, he said that she should not speak on whether the pigs were tortured. And clearly, with the, the, the evidence that we submitted, showed uh, many cases of, of torture. And I'd like to quote from Dr. Manisha, um, Dr. Manisha Decca. So she said the case was asking the courts to consider whether animals are persons. So that was a good thing. And she said the, court, the case also was asking the court to consider the analogy between human and animal oppression and to consider the concept of bearing witness of animals. And so she said these were all progressive point, you know, aspects of the case. Um, but in terms of, she was very disappointed with the ruling because it's a, the departure point of recognizing animal suffering and animal vulnerability uh, was, 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 was ignored in this case, and the verdict normalized industrial farming. Um, so she said anything that is connected with emotion, compassion, or care is seen as suspect. And she said of, of the four witnesses, the two men, two women, the men spoke uh, very effectively on the environmental devastation wreaked by animal agriculture and the diseases caused by meat, dairy, and eggs. The women spoke of why we need to be more compassionate to animals because of their sentience, sociability, and suffering. And the judge challenged um, the, the two women witnesses on impartiality grounds. So it wasn't just, it's not just a feminist analysis, it's also uh, a vegan analysis because it shows an, an animal rights analysis because the suffering of these animals was completely ignored in his verdict. Um, I just, uh, just a brief, I want to show you a little bit of my lawyer speaking on the public uh, interest aspect. Sorry. Okay. Argument that we were advancing, should the judge find that she had committed the offense of mischief, however technically so, 
was uh, the public interest offense. The comparisons with historical figures, Gandhi, Mandela, and Susan B. Anthony, were all in context of the argument that when you are consider considering the defense of the public good, you have to consider all of the harm that Anita was seeking to avoid. And do we really have to look back years and years on injustices committed in the court system before we learn from our mistakes, before we learn that it is unacceptable to treat the other any differently? Okay, so in conclusion, uh, again, returning to Tolstoy, and I, uh, he's very much an anchor uh, for our movement, and when I was in the pig trial, I reread his book, A Calendar of Wisdom, and I gave a copy to, as I said, Chris Green. Uh, I strongly recommend this book. You can get on Amazon, A Calendar of Wisdom, and uh, this is from his journals. Uh, he talks about following your conscience, and that's what guided us in this trial, like just doing what is right, and you can't fight the golden rule, was one of our points and that animals are not property. So he, Tolstoy said in his journal of 1895, the inner law is what we call reason, conscience, love, the good, God, words like that. These words have different meanings, but all from different angles mean one and the same thing. The world can be looked upon in this way. A world exists governed by certain well-known laws, and within, the th within this world are being subject to the same laws, but at the same time, bear in themselves another law, not in accord with the former laws of the world, a higher law. And this law must inevitably triumph within these beings and defeat the lower law. And in this struggle and in the great victory of the higher law over the lower law, in this only is life for a person in the whole world. So he said, always you know, follow your conscience. Um, and sometimes that means civil disobedience. Um, and that's the right thing to do. So what happened with respect to the SAVE movement? Um, when, I, when the incident took place two and a half years ago, in June 2015, uh, there were 35 SAVE groups. And now, two and a half years later, there's uh, 320 groups, or 314 here in the chart. Um, and so that's a, group, that's a growth of tenfold. And there are now gr groups in um, 40 countries on six continents, and it's growing in an exponential rate. So uh, in 2000. Uh, 16, it grew, uh, it, it um, doubled from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, from 50 to 100. And then last year, it almost tripled. And so we plan to, you know, con you know continue with that rate of growth. And we have a conscious, uh, conscious organizing strategy. So this is hard to see graph, but it's uh, the growth that took place in 2017. And a lot of the growth was in North America and Europe, but also in Central America and South America. Uh, we, never, we had no groups at the beginning of last year in Central and South America, no groups in Africa, no groups in Asia, and all that changed last year. We, at the beginning of last year, we only had 24 safe groups in the United States. Now we have uh, 82, so it tripled in the U.S. And uh, one of the groups is Boston Animal Save, and we have Dominique Ruzala, who's here with a group, sitting in the front there. Um, but that, that's, you know, we put it in perspective. Uh, uh, we know our place in history. We study other social movements. We have to ask for more. Uh, to give you some context, in the 1830s, there were 300 anti-slavery societies in the state of Ohio alone. And uh, community organizers, including Qu this Quaker, Benjamin Lundy, would travel, he traveled 2,400 miles, held 50 public meetings in a few months, and helped set up a lot of anti-slavery societies. So we use that classic community organizing strategy. Uh, we go to VegFest. So we send out teams to go to the U.S. Veg Fest, Latin America, South America, Europe, and hold a vigil after the Veg Fest. So it's a really good place to recruit because you've got veg curious people, you've got a lot of vegans who are not active yet, and you've got active vegans. So it's a great place to recruit. And ine inevitably, when you do a Veg Fest, you help create a new safe group. Uh, we also have other organizing drives where, that are more economically efficient. Uh, we send people on tours ranging for, from a month to a few months. In one case, we currently have people on a tour for like six months. And they go town to town and, and go to multiple countries and set up groups. And that's how we grew very quickly in Central and South America. And we know from studying other social movements that it's really important to spend a lot of money on organizing. So if, uh, there's the union Service Employees International Union. Uh, is the largest and fastest growing union in the U.S., and they, 
they, they used, used to spend 5% on organizing, and then in the early 80s, they switched strategies and spent 25% on organizing. And then the leader of that group back then was John Sweeney, and then he became the head of AFL-CIO, and he also pushed that coalition of unions to spend more money on organizing. Uh, United Farm Workers hired hundreds of organizers to go to towns across the U.S. and implement grape boycotts and wine boycotts. So, so they combined a, a labor organizing strategy with a community organizing strategy that wasn't only site specific at, at, in the farm fields, but went to the, reach the middle classes by going to cities and getting them involved to support the campaign. And it was incredibly effective. Oh, and these are these wonderful organizers and they saved a chicken at that particular vigil. So you see rescued Pepito Rosario, who was named after the woman who worked at the slaughterhouse. Um, and then those are the two, the two activists there in the picture on the left are going on a six month tour. So Ruth is from the Netherlands and Siobhan is from Norway. So we use a love-based approach and when this Placard was first introduced by Kathleen, one of our organizers, No Hate for Truckers. We're here to show love for the, the pigs. It was a little controversial, but now it's like a key part of our campaigns. And uh, it just, it's just a love-based approach where we're non-judgmental um, and we try to change people with love. And we kindly point out to the, to the oppressor what is wrong. And Tolstoy said it's very important to communicate with the truth with love, kindness, simplicity, and humbleness. And just drawing from his book again on how it's important to connect the dots for an oppressor, you say, he said, but however much they try to deceive themselves and others, they all know that what they are doing is opposed to all the beliefs which they profess and in the depths of their soul, when they are left alone with their conscience, they are ashamed and miserable at the recollection of it, especially if the baseness of their actions has been pointed out to them. So that's where we come in. So you point out the baseness of people's actions in a kind way. And um, so uh, we, Gandhi said social change will occur not in the dim and distant future, but in, within a measurable time, the measure being the measure of effort that we put forth. So in other words, the more of us putting more of our time and resources into uh, creating a world of animal equality, where, no, where we don't harm others, where we respect others uh, as equals, uh, is doable. It's just like the more time and resources we put into it, the faster it will happen. And one of the ways it will happen is if you see everyone as an organizer, and in community organizing approaches, that's a classic idea. Everyone is an organizer. Uh, we use Marshall Gantz's concept of expanding team leadership. Marshall Gantz is a professor of sociology at Harvard, and he was a director of operations for United Farm Workers. And uh, the United Farm Workers ran the most successful campaigns at unionizing agricultural workers in California, which is really difficult to do. Other unions had failed, they succeeded, partly because of uh, expanding leadership teams. And that's how we organized the SAVE movement. We also have political and economic democracy. It's not hierarchical. So each region has their own, a certain amount of autonomy. They have their own budgets. They open their own bank accounts. They run their own campaigns, and if somebody has a good idea, we adopt, you know, the other groups adopt it. So it's not centralized, it's not Toronto-based, it's a, it's a global movement. Um, I just I wanted to close with uh, encouraging you to, you live in, you, you live in Boston, and uh, you know, if there's a slaughterhouse in your city, you have an obligation, a duty to uh, proactively go there and bear witness, and I would argue also to organize. And, um, and if you come from somewhere else and you're just here studying, you know, maybe when you go back home, you could find out where the slaughterhouses are and go there, visit the slaughterhouse and see if you could get a save group started. And I wanted um, Dominique just to announce the two vig the, the regular vigils that they do and yeah. So the slaughterhouse is actually going to be a nonprofit slaughterhouse, and I'm not really sure how they even were able to get the status, but it's something that they've been arguing that they need a local place to slaughter their animals. Um, and they've been bragging, you know, this is going to be really humane, this is going to be really great, and so we've been there just challenging, no, killing cannot be humane. Um, so we actually definitely get a lot of reactions from the community. Um, 
It's actually a very busy road, so a lot of people see us. A lot of people have actually stopped to talk, at us, talk, talk to us and um, read our signs, and they say they, have, they see us all the time, and they wanted to know more. So we've definitely raised a lot of awareness in the community. We've also been interviewed for the local newspapers, where they also um, actually gave a lot of quotes from us saying that eating meat is cruel and slaughtering okay. it. We're also we're going to be there on Thursday. Um, we're also going to be at Den Destin Farm in Bridgewater, which is a currently running slaughterhouse. Um, so it's a small scale slaughterhouse. It's um, it's not like the pictures you saw with thousands of pigs coming in every day. But I've actually personally been inside of it, so I've actually seen the animals dying there. I've seen um, I've heard pigs screaming. They have some sheep and goats in the back that you can purchase for slaughter, and those animals are the most terrified animals I've ever seen in my life because they can. So people like to say, oh, you know, it's a small local place. It's good, like I can buy my meat here and not feel bad. That is not true, I've seen these locations. Um, so, and that's also actually on a very busy road. So when we were there, um, we also received a lot of attention from the community. There were school buses with high schoolers passing by. They passed by the slaughterhouse every day. So uh, we were actually able to like talk and interact with people at like the intersection too. Right. There's, there's a lot of traffic. Okay. So um, we definitely encourage you guys to come out, um, like us on Facebook, and um, come to our events. We try to hold things that are actually more in Cambridge and Boston, too, so that people can get involved and um, help improve the situation for animals. Right. So there's a double vigil tomorrow um, when, from 8 to 10 and 10.30 to noon, and then there's vigils every Sunday. So please please join. Like It's quite an experience to... It's, a, it's an obligation, I believe, to see the victims in your own town around the world, but starting in your own town. Okay, thanks. Uh, so is there time for questions? Or? Some folks might need to leave for class. Feel free to do so, but we've got the room for a while to take questions. Can we the microphone? How's this? Okay. How do you go about convincing a slaughterhouse to arrange for the trucks to stop so people can bear witness? I can't imagine why they would want to do that. A lot of uh, safe groups have agreements. So uh, we, we have a safe movement handbook where we have uh, sample letters to write to a slaughterhouse. And management styles at slaughterhouses are different. So at the poultry slaughterhouse in Toronto, the manager sort of understands why we're there and even respects us and is probably doing that job because it's a high paying job and does, you know, he has children, we, we talk, because we use a love based approach, we get to know the slaughterhouse workers, the managers, the owners, and a lot of times they actually support us and they know what they're doing is not, not really right. Um, uh, also, uh, there's a safety issue, like people could get run over, so I think they have an obligation, so we also ask that they, you know, let us do what we're doing, we're not gonna go away, we're get, we regularly bear witness, let's try to do that safely. So we, we write to them and say, can we have an agreement? And we also sometimes approach the police, and sometimes the police facilitate agree an agreement. So a lot of uh, slaughterhouses around the world, they, they have uh, vigils, uh, they have agreements. A lot of them don't, but we, we encourage an agreement. Thank you for telling us about your work. I really admire what you do. I wanted to ask you, what have the reactions from the mass media been? Have you had big coverage of, for example, your pig trial or the, your work in general? Yeah, we, we, we started in 2010 and then the pig trial happened in 2015 to 17 and it was remarkable how much media we got for the pig trial. And it just shows you the importance of law and court cases because there's all these points of intervention for the media. And, uh, you know, media get, you know, they get a lot of advertising dollars for like bacon and pork and things like that. So sometimes it might be difficult for them to cover like a regular vigil. But when it's a court case, there's a certain legitimacy associated with it. So, you know, the law, you know, it's amazing what, uh, what you can do with a court case in terms of media coverage. I also had two very savvy lawyers who knew how to turn the case around and put animal agriculture on trial. They were... And oh, I, I contacted PETA as soon as the case happened, 
and they helped with media releases and getting the word out worldwide. So we got, they helped and they also brought some celebrities in. So Maggie Q, who's a star in Designated Survivor, the TV shows, she came, um, spoke, and Ingrid Newkirk came twice to the pig trial and uh, even bore witness with us before that. And then uh, McKenna Grace, she's a 10-year-old child actress and gifted. She's also in um, I, Tanya. She's the 10-year-old playing Tanya. Uh, she's amazing. She's so eloquent. She came to the pig trial for the verdict, and she also bore witness before uh, attending the verdict. So it was a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, my lawyer said it's probably the best thing that ever happened to Toronto Pig State. So yeah, the courts can play a role, even though the judgment, as I said, we, there's a critique of the judgment, very disappointing in terms of uh, making any progress on animal law. So I don't know if you follow what's happening to Joe Cardstrong now in the UK, and he's dragged through the media, and you know the media they love to use certain frames because they are newsworthy. So they, you know, they're call he's called an extremist. I don't know. Did you have when the trial was in the media? Was there any frames like that used, or? Yeah, and initially in the big trial, the f there was comments about, um, you know, there's a danger of the, 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 that the food supply is being tainted, you know, with activists giving water to pigs. But that, that was just initially, and, you know, I had contacted my lawyer saying, oh my God, this is horrible, uh, should we sue them? And he goes, no, 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 you know, this is part of the media process, let them work that out, it actually generates interest in the trial, and so I did, I just, you know, left it, and it was true, like, it, that, that was a story for a while, and then they went, but by and large, the media coverage was really positive, and I would argue even Joey Carpstrong's uh, coverage is really positive because they are showing the images of the animals being born witness to. So I don't know how many people know Joey Carpstrong, but he's like a vegan celebrity from Australia, and he has like in the past he was like used drugs and went to prison, and so they they but he, he himself used that in media releases because that generated interest, and I mean that's the way the media works. So. But I think he, he, he was, he's very effective at getting the word out on veganism and our duty to be activists. Uh, first, I just want to echo Cillier's comments about how amazing it is, the, the work that you're doing and the movement that you've started and um, the rapid growth is really um, promising and incredible. Um, when you first started bearing witness emotionally, how difficult was it for you and how has that changed over time? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know. Uh, Initially, bearing witness, uh, like it's shocking, like you live in another world, like you feel like this is insane, and uh, uh, you, you, really, you feel like you're on another planet when you're bearing witness or at a slaughterhouse. It's not part of our normal way of thinking and what we see. And, um, but I, I thought, oh, you know, we're doing three vigils a week, it's great. Uh, what made, makes me happy is when I see new people coming, so that sort of balances out the difficulty. And I thought, oh, I could keep on doing this three times a week. But then, you know, after you see certain things, I, got, I did get burned out a little bit about two years ago, but I backed off a bit. So I don't go to three vigils a week anymore. I go to one vigil a week. Um, and I did some self-healing. I never did self-healing before. You know, suddenly I started buying incense, things like that, but, um, or, uh, and just taking care, a little more care. Um, so, yeah, there is that aspect. And different people are different, you know, but most people find that bearing witness is uh, very meaningful and it changes your life in a good way because you see the impact and it's important to bear witness to the truth. I mean, we're all animal lovers and if you love someone, uh, that means you spend your time and uh, effort to try to help them. Like that's what love is. And uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's incredibly meaningful. And also the thing that makes it easy for our movement to grow is the fact that there's so much community. So we spend a lot of time on the social aspect of just like, you know, uh, for example, LA Animal Safe, they always have a dinner before or after the vigil. So they do that community building and you support each other. And that's, yeah, so it makes it sustainable. And also I think the fact that it's love-based, if it was an angry movement, it was hateful, it's very easy to be angry at the workers. That's the kind of thing that makes it not very sustainable in my view. And I, you know, when we first started doing vigils, we had like a thumbs down campaign, like thumbs down to the slaughter. And I would like, like glare at the driver and I'd be shaking for half an hour. And I thought, geez, this doesn't really work. You really gotta <laughs> use a love-based approach because it's better for everyone. Um, 
Yeah, because Tolstoy said, like, there's so much hate and evil in the world. If you're going to change that, you have to add love. Like, if you have more love to the world, that's what's going to change the world. You can't fight evil with evil or hate with hate. Yeah, so. there's amazing quotes in there and shining the light, obviously, and that being half the, that's sort of half the battle. Um, one other question I have is when, when people come up to you, and you, you mentioned this too, just because you know, there's busy intersections and people are talking to you, I'm just curious what they're, as they hear about what you're doing, people that are not vegans or not vegetarians or not really sensitive to this until they talk to you, what their reaction is. Because I see it as sort of a spectrum where there are people that think that killing innocent animals or humans, anybody, is, is wrong. And then on the other end of the spectrum, um, it, it's fine as long as they're not humans, like the truck driver said. And then sort of in the middle is, well, I'm fine with them being killed, but I want, them, you know, I want it done humanely. Um, and I'm just curious what your experience is sort of within that spectrum of, of what people usually are, you know, sound like, think, think like, and, and are talking about. Yeah, that's a good question. Like it's, um, yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're slowly growing. Like when we do these weekly vigils, like people off the street sometimes join us. Uh, it depends what you do, like where your like slaughterhouse is. So if you do door to door campaigns, that's what we did in Toronto, but that slaughterhouse went bankrupt. But we used to do door to door, have community events like veggie dog giveaways. You meet the community. The more intense your ta tactics, the better it is. So like it, a lot of it is in your power, like depending on the strategy tactics you use. So. Kate Broffenbrenner, she's a professor of labor at Cornell University, and she wrote a book called Organizing to Win. You know, how can the labor movement win? And she, she talked about comprehensive campaigns, and they're defined as five or more tactics. So if you only use one tactic, you're not going to be effect that effective. So if you just bear witness and stand there, but if you go door to door, if you have community events, if you, like, if you really have an intense campaign and... Uh, you can, yeah, you're going to impact the community more. So it's, it, some of it is in your hands. So like, we also run ad campaigns in the subway. Why well, love one but eat the other? Toronto Pigs say it. We do, like, we do a lot of, we have VR headsets. James set up that program. Um, uh, we do vegan outreach. Uh, we have pay-per-view at uh, college campuses where we pay students $10 to watch Cowspiracy or Earthlings. So yeah, it's just, it, you know, it, it, strategy and tactics are very important. And what's important is like, what is in your hands? It's not so much, you know, what are the other people gonna do? Like, you know, what are you gonna do? And, you know, are you gonna do it in a love-based way? And the more you do, and the more people you get involved, the faster the world will change. But yeah, we, we, we do get a range of, like, I love bacon, get a life, get a job, you know, all these kind of comments from some people. But, but then we get a lot of honks. We say honk to show mercy for the pig. We get lots of honks. Um, but the question is, you know, how do you get those people out there? And we found that using all day vigils with a guest, special guest, uh, we, more than half the people are new when we do that. The regular vigils are good because you're just there, you're just building momentum, but then you got to do something special. You know, we, we write to celebrities, like we wrote to um, Djokovic, the tennis player. And we, we keep on writing to like celebrities, trying to invite them. And uh, uh, LA has had a lot of success, but it's a little more difficult in Toronto. I think we have time for one more question, and then Anita, I'm happy to sit or stay. We've got the room for a little bit until people who want to ask questions informally can stick around. Anyone else? Okay, well, join me in thanking Anita for coming here.